Good morning, my super friends. It is a very fine weekend here in Melbourne. Now, I'm going to do my regular weekly, well, I try to make it weekly, Aboriginal awareness shout out. But before I do that, I just wanted to say something, which is that I've had quite a few people complain about me doing it and saying that I'm making political statements and that sort of thing. And uh, so I just wanted to explain a little bit about why I'm doing it. The original prompt for it was obviously the Black Lives Matter protests, but uh, really what it's about is I live in a country with a very long history that predates European settlement, but a lot of that history is ignored and uh, a lot of people aren't aware of it. So part of this is really a way of making myself accountable to be learning more about the history of Australia from uh, from an Aboriginal perspective. So by doing something like a little shout out at the start of each live stream, it's basically a way of forcing myself uh, each week to go and find something um, interesting or cool or whatever about um, about Aboriginal culture and it's a way of me myself learning something because I want to know more about it. And then a little 30 second thing at the start, just saying whatever it is that I came across. So I know some people probably find it offensive, but this is what I'm doing because I want to know more about, uh, about the Aboriginal people of Australia, the country that I live in. So the shout out that I'm doing today is a bit of a strange one. It's to Australia Post, and that is because they did something really cool. Uh, so Rachel McPhail came up with the really good idea of having Australia Post support um, in traditional place names. So Australia is a very big country, and there were, uh, there were many Aboriginal tribes and groups and nations within it. And so there are traditional place names for a lot of Australia. But of course we use the European style place names for postage. And only a couple of months ago, Rachel started lobbying Australia Post to allow the inclusion of traditional place names in uh, postage. And Australia Post have done it, which is super cool. So I'm going to drop a little link about that story into the chat if I can find my chat window it is right here and Australia Post have now officially incorporated this into their addressing guidelines so if you are sending mail in Australia you can include a line on it that says something like uh, we're a one country how, how do I pronounce that <laughs> this is the thing is that I know I say a little about it, I need to learn about it myself. Wewarung country, which is where I am. So, that's cool. Now, the a couple of other shout outs I wanted to do. One is something that I just saw this morning, which is really, really cool. This is fantastic. Um, many of you may know Stephen Spone, who is a gamer who for many years has been... Uh, He's been working to improve inclusivity and accessibility in games and to help people with disabilities to be able to, um, to use games in a way that suits them. And um, he and his charity have done a huge amount of work to make access to computers and gaming uh, much easier for people with disabilities. And one of the things that he decided to do was to start a fundraising uh, program. He wanted to try to raise one million dollars to allow uh, for to run projects that would allow um, disabled gamers to be able to to play. <clears throat> and uh, during the night, our time, he was surprised live on uh, on his live stream when Twitch donated just straight up the one million dollars. That he needed for his campaign so <clears throat> that is a really cool moment i'm going to 
drop a link and that is the link to so this is Stephen's Twitter post not his, uh, his tweet and this includes a little snippet of video which is the moment when he was surprised on his live stream so he was on the live stream uh, with a couple of other people to talk about the campaign and the bombshell was dropped on him when they said we are giving you one million dollars so that's very cool <clears throat> and the final little entry shout out that I want to do is to my dad who um, who often watches these live streams but right now he's if he's watching it he's watching it from a hospital bed he had open heart surgery a couple of weeks ago and then had some complications with it so he had a second round of surgery last week and he's going into surgery again tomorrow so to my dad if you're sitting there watching this, hang in there and just know that we all love you. Okay, so, <clears throat> um, oh, <laughs> and I should say, m my dad is super fit. So he's 84 and up until not all that long ago, uh, if we were out on the bikes, I would have to work pretty hard to keep up with him. <laughs> Uh, and even up until a couple of weeks ago, like just before he went into hospital, he was riding, uh, riding his bike every day, like going out on 15k rides. <clears throat> so pretty amazing for an 84 year old. And uh, last week I talked about the difficulty of how to do tutorials for, uh, for software and put them in some kind of a video format. So one of the things I've been struggling with is how do I make videos that adequately, <clears throat> sorry, adequately explain how to go through a series of steps. And those steps could be quite specific. Like they need to be, you need to update your list of packages and, uh, you know, install this, uh, this repo key, update list of packages, install this package, edit this config file. You know, they're very specific steps that you have to go to, to through to set up some types of software. And I've been trying to do that on video supplemented by web-based text instruction for a long time. And um, I had some really good suggestions. Thank you very much for uh, people that sent me ideas about that. I'd like to call out one person in particular, uh, Stefan Huell, who sent me an email. And the way he worded the email really made me rethink the way I'm... Now, this is actually a really good example of um, when your mind is going down a certain track and you're trying to solve a certain problem and your perspective is guiding you down a very specific path when you need to change your perspective and maybe take a different path. And it's a very little change, but the, um, the essence of Stefan's email was that I need to stop thinking of the video as being the primary source of the content. I mean, he didn't use these, these sorts of words. This is my interpretation <clears throat> of what he was suggesting. I think because what's happened is that I started making video tutorials way back, like many, many years ago. And so I think of Superhouse as videos. And I don't, and then I think of things like the web pages associated with the videos as something that supports them, not as the primary content. And what I need to do is change the way I think about it and maybe have more of a split in terms of the content. So if I'm doing a video that involves things like installing, um, you know, Grafana and Node-RED and all of those sorts of things, I don't necessarily need to show all of the steps in the video because all of that information is on the supporting web page. The thing is that in my head, what I think is people are subscribed on YouTube, so they come along and they see a tutorial on YouTube and it's the tutorial, the YouTube version of the tutorial has to be useful and in a self-contained way. Like if someone is just watching it on YouTube, it needs to go through all of the steps 
so that by the time they got to the end of the video, then they know how to do what it is that I'm explaining. But I need to give up on that idea a little bit. Well, give up is the wrong word. I need to let go of that idea a little bit and perhaps rely more on text-based uh, explanations of things. So in a video, I would really talk more about the architecture of a system, why I chose certain pieces of software or hardware and you know those sorts of design decisions and not necessarily go through oh and now you type in this command and then you type in this command and now you click this button and now the job is done and the thing is that that sort of instruction changes over time anyway because you know software changes the UI changes commands change <laughs> things like the addresses of repos change and videos can't really be edited to fix that sort of thing whereas text-based explanations can be kept up to date Alrighty, so um, yeah I mean what uh, Stefan suggested was was quite similar to what other people have said to me as well so I just wanted to give a thank you to all the people that uh, that suggested thinking about this in a slightly different way so for the uh, the data logging tutorial I'm still going to release it with the it's basically like fast forwarding through all of the instructions but um, uh, yeah I'm going to for future videos I'm going to think more about the video showing what it is and explaining it and not necessarily follow the bouncing ball and type in these commands to achieve the end result all of that information is on the Superhouse website anyway and it's much easier there because you can just copy and paste everything. It's much better. Okay, so what else? Now I came into today pretty much unprepared with no specific topics in mind other than I might give you a little bit of a tour of the changes that I've made for my reflow oven setup, trying to improve the ventilation. And the thing is I don't even know if it works properly yet because I haven't done a reflow job for two weeks and three days now which is how long it's been since that time that I got really really sick uh, yes so uh, <laughs> Mako just said uh, do you ultrasonic clean ESP32 boards um, my guess is that that question came up because of the thing on Twitter this morning about putting Vroom32 modules into an ultrasonic cleaner because Vroom 32 modules have a little um, uh, where is I'm sure I've got one really close that I could show you there's got to be a Vroom 32 module uh, yes I have a whole stack of them down there in a box but they're all uh, yeah, how can this not be easy to find and I've got, I've got these ones. Okay, I'll just show you the one in the, I'll show you one in a tape. Let's go to overhead. Come on, change cameras. Change cameras. Nope, it doesn't want to. There it is. Okay, so here we've got some Vroom 32 modules, and they've got this metal can over the top, which has this little hole in it right here. And so the question, of course, is if you've put one of these modules onto a PCB, should you put it into an ultrasonic cleaner? And the answer from me is I don't know. I've actually never put a board with a Vroom 32 into an ultrasonic cleaner. And it is partly because of this question. So I would really like to know what is going on. Oh, frame per second is quite low. Okay. I don't know what might be called. Yeah, Dustin Watts asked for it on Twitter. Yeah, that's right, Mako. So, um, yes. Oh, hang on. There is a comment that has been held for review, but it, um, it actually seems quite decent. So, <laughs> approved. Cool. So, um, okay. Now, in terms of what's inside this, in the can underneath that metal 
there shouldn't be anything in there that would have a problem with going into an ultrasonic cleaner. And if this can was not on the module, I would have no problems whatsoever with putting it through. The issue, oh, look, you can see my <laughs> desktop there. I didn't realize that was there. Okay, so there you can see my live chat interface. Uh, so what um, my issue with it would just be having difficulty drying it out. And if you put it in an oven to bake it afterwards to dry out, it's probably okay. But the issue is that if moisture gets in through that little hole, so you put this into an ultrasonic bath and um, it's probably gonna end up with this whole can full of whatever your cleaning solution is, which could be, you know, it could be just distilled water depending on what you're using in your ultrasonic cleaner, or it could be a specialized uh, flux removing cleaning material. And then when you take it out, of course, that can is probably going to be full of water. So, um, I, I would actually like to know what the recommended procedure is for that sort of thing. Um, and I don't know the answer. Sorry. <laughs> I've avoided it. Um, in fact, I'm going to take you on a tour in a minute and you'll see where my ultrasonic cleaner is. Uh, but I have not put those through because I have never really had an answer to that. All right, so let's have a look at the... On that note, since we're talking about the ultrasonics, let's go for... Oh, Dana just asked, what's the reason for the hole? So... My understanding is that the reason is for pressure equalization. I could be wrong with that. Um, well, actually, one thing you could do is just put a bit of capped on tape or something over the hole, which is a pretty common thing when... Uh, the thing is that the inside of the module is going to be nice and clean anyway because it'll have been you know, cleaned at the point of manufacturing before the can was applied to it. And it's only the other solder joints on the board that have been reflowed that you want to clean. So uh, put a bit of tape over the hole and then it should be okay. <laughs> Johnny said, actually, the hole is floating out the magic smoke. Yes. Um, yeah, and Frederick pointed out it would be filled with the solution because of the high frequency pushing it through, ignoring the fact that fluids mostly don't go through tight holes. Yeah, so if you um, dropped this into just a piece of liquid like a piece of a pe yeah a solid piece of liquid if you just drop this into water the surface tension would probably stop the liquid going into this and you would end up with an air bubble trapped inside and the inside of the can would stay dry but because it's in an ultrasonic cleaner it is quite likely that the vibration of the ultrasonics would break down the surface tension and it would allow the moisture to penetrate and the air to bubble out in tiny little effervescent bubbles <laughs> like a like opening a bottle of black label uh yeah so um oh mike o'connor said i hear somewhere plugging it with nail polish would that work hmm, i don't know and mike mako said yeah but where the shield is sold and aren't there small crevices yes there are so this is a really interesting question that I can't help answer, but luckily there are many clever people here who can possibly help with that question. So I would love to hear. Um, there are some small crevices and let's have a closer look before we go to the portable camera and I'll show you the other thing. Come on. This thing is really having trouble switching cameras today. There we go. All right. So what have we got? Uh, we, what we don't have is focus. Oh, we do kind of have focus, but let's, um, because I want to get this at a strange angle, I'm going to move this over here, pointing at the ground, and I'll see if I can get the distance just right. So you can see that the can is soldered down. <laughs> what you can see there, it looks like two rows of connectors back to back. One of those is the reflection. <laughs> the back row is the reflection of the connectors in the silver of the can. But in between the two rows of connectors, you can see a little silver line, which is solder. 
and the can is soldered down to the carrier PCB all the way around. However, oops, let's see if I can get it in the right place. See that corner right there? That is a hole. There's a little gap in there, an air gap. And there's an air gap on that corner. It's weird, the lighting on this is really quite bad. Uh, so it's, it's well sealed most of the way around apart from those corners. But my understanding of the purpose of this little hole in the can is for pressure equalization. I could be wrong about that. If anyone has a better explanation, please share it. I'd be very interested to hear. So, uh, oh, Dodgy suggested maybe the hole is a location dot, but I don't think so. Uh, certainly not for a module like this because it's so, um, it's such a specific footprint that it's impossible to misorient it. All right, uh, so let me see, what have we got? Portable camera, let's go for a walk. Hello. Oh, maybe you can see yourself. That's you on the chat right there. You can see it moving if you look very closely. All right, so what I did was took my reflow oven and I'll just move this over here. That location right there where those white boxes are stacked up, that's a delivery that's gonna be collected. Well, uh, Andy is gonna be collecting those boxes from me later today. Those boxes are full of parts for the swag badge, electronic conference badges for LCA 2021. That's where the reflow oven used to be. So now I've got to try to, hang on, I'll collapse the legs a little bit on this tripod so I can carry it through this gap more easily. And the bathroom door is open and this is all rearranged. So you can see there is this black racking here. That's all new. I just put that in a couple of days ago and you can see the reflow oven is now sitting there. So if I bring this around here, this is the part of the bathroom that used to be a shower and is not anymore. So you can see the old shower fitting there. That's where the shower head used to be fitted off. Just over there somewhere. And my Mendelwax 3D printer is just sitting on top of the, um, of the fume hood. So this isn't even plugged in yet. In fact, I have not yet run this, but what you can see just down the side, oh, and there's my ultrasonic cleaner. So if you look down the side there, you can see this big duct coming out of it. So that's a 150 mil duct and I 3D printed an adapter just on there. This is uh, duct taped onto the adapter. So there's a 150 millimeter hole through the side of this fume hood. And then that duct goes up there and up. And you can see that I've removed the old exhaust fan. The exhaust fan is just sitting up on the shelf at the moment, so it can be put back in. I did it this way because I wanted to make it non-invasive. I wanted to be able to reverse this with no uh, consequences. So at the moment, just up inside the ceiling there is a, very, is a fairly large extraction fan, which is plugged into the socket that the old exhaust fan was plugged into. So if I press the, the button to turn on the exhaust fan for the bathroom, you can see the duct there is starting to shake. That's because the fan is running. Don't know if you can hear it, you probably can't. And now there is air being sucked in all around here it's being sucked in backwards and then being taken out the back and up through the duct and that's all being vented outside. So it travels through the ceiling space uh, to the end wall and then it goes out through an external vent out there. Oh, and as I was saying before, there's my ultrasonic cleaner. It's now in a nice handy spot just near the reflow oven. But none of this is actually plugged in right now because I've just been physically getting things in place and I only just got the exhaust system installed. Uh, so I haven't even connected anything up and run a test job yet. So I don't know if it's gonna work. 
It may, it may not. Let's come back around to here. Oh, and one other little thing that has changed since last week is um, I just got myself a little function generator, which is mounted in here. Oh, I need to attach this. And I made this little uh, frame, which is a combination. Hang on, I'm going to put this tripod down so that I'm not making you totally seasick by waving this all around. All right, here we go. So this is just some um, uh, plywood. I think it's like three millimeter, four millimeter plywood, which I've cut and glued. There is a 3D printed bracket in here, which the function gen is mounted into. It's just clipped in. And that gives me a space where I can chuck notebooks and things as well. So my random lab notebooks can all go in there, but I need to attach this a little bit more securely. Now one thing is that this is not quite finished yet because right now there are no cables in plugged into this and this function generator has the B and C sockets on the side and then it's got power sockets on this side. So what I'm waiting for um, is some right angle cables. So right angle B and C socket will go into the edge here and then internally it'll travel back through it come around under the bench and then I'm going to have just down here somewhere I will have the um, extensions terminating so I can plug cables into it down here and then control it up here. It's part of my plan basically to have uh, convenient outlets for things along here and then the control surfaces up higher but unobstructed so I don't have cables in front of everything. That's the idea anyway getting there. All right, so I'll put you back over there, looking up this way. And maybe today, I, what I need to do is start catching up on some, uh, some questions change. That's it start catching up on some things that have been in Discord because I have not looked at Discord now for two and a half weeks, I think. Something like that. Yeah, oh, okay. So, uh, Magic Blue Smoke said, that's how we do it at work with many connections on a control surfaces plugged into a power supply. Yeah, cool. Uh, how will I... Uh, hmm, sorry, <laughs> just catching up on chat here. So Mako said, how will you power the appliances? Uh, which, um, oh, just jumping back a bit. Dana said, one forum answer from a moderator on ESP32 site mentions the hole in the room as locating hole for SMT placement. That's interesting. Um... It's possible. <laughs> I can certainly imagine how that would work. You could make a little bracket. You could have a, a custom pickup tool that goes over the top of it with a pin so that it goes into it. Uh, I don't think it would be necessary from a, an optical alignment point of view, although it might be. That could be used for optical alignment. Yeah, lots of, uh, lots of reasons. That could be used. Oh, <laughs> see you on. You're here. Unexpected maker. Thanks for coming along. <clears throat> mm, sorry, my brain is scattered. What was I thinking about earlier? I was going to answer. Oh, James is here from Milliwake. I was going to answer some questions in Discord. So, for that, I need Discord. Let's see. Now, in the uh, in Discord, there is a section for a whole lot of um, you know, for people to ask questions. So, a question for the lab tour: How do you store your SMTP SMT components once they're out of the tape but not used? That was a question from Daryl. And the short answer is not very well. 
I've got, let me show you. Uh, <laughs> this solution has worked out so badly that I hardly use it. And you'll see that in just a moment. This is what I thought was going to be the solution, but in practice, it turned out not to be that good. What I've got is I went down to Spotlight and I got myself a plastic container. Where this came from is I have lots of, you know, these sorts of things like 0603 resistors there. I've got another one, 0402 resistors. I've got SMD uh, uh, caps. So for things that are out of uh, tape, okay, there are really a couple of categories here. One is things that are regular parts like resistors and capacitors. And once those are out of tape, it's easy to store because they just go into a box like this. And open it up and then you've got lots of little things in here. Now this particular kit came, what was this one? This one was an 0402 capacitor kit but there were far more little holes in this container than there were values they supplied. The supplied values only came down to here. So it was the top half and a little bit of the case. So what I did then was use the spare sections all along here for 0603 capacitors. And some 0805s and things are <laughs> randomly in there as well. So when you pop open one of these, you'll find Typically 0603 parts, but some of them have also got 0805s in there. So 100 picofarad capacitors, whatever. You just grab out the one you want. So that's what I do for, uh, for surface mount parts. I bought those as kits. So this one, for example, 0603 resistor kit. I would have bought this, well, it was a few years ago now, but I bought it uh, complete. So it comes with all of the different values in it. Let's do this. Much better idea. Since I have these extra cameras, I can take advantage of it. Come on. So it's got all of these values across it. And like if you need an 11K resistor, pop it open, you got the values in there. So as these come, what was in this? 144 values, 100 pieces per value. But what happens is you end up using up some values and not others. So in this case, you know, there are the classics like 1K, 10K, those values you go through like crazy. Uh, 4.75K, because they're often used on uh, I2C squared pull-ups and things. So in here, what would have happened is that I would have used up these 1K resistors a long, long time ago, the ones that came in the kit. But what I do is just cut off a length of tape from the pick and place machine and then peel the cover off and decant it and top up this little stash in here. So in general, that's how I keep track of loose parts. But getting back to what I was starting to talk about earlier, this thing, I thought this would be really useful because that process works so well for regular parts like 0402 resistors, etc. I thought it would be really good to just do the same sort of style of thing, but for other general purpose parts. And you can see in here 2 in 7002, 1 in 4004, etc. But maybe it's just the quality of this. This is pretty rubbish actually. It's got all of these little loose containers in it. You can see there are some missing there. And in fact, if I reach up above the bench, you can see I've got blue and green LEDs. And inside these containers, it's got a strip of tape, which has been coiled up. And you can also see there are a whole lot of loose ones under there. If I do that, you can see them a bit better. So that is loose green 0603 LEDs. But the problem is that these containers do not seal very well. They're badly made, which is why those LEDs are not actually in the container here. Because if I tip them up, they probably all fall out. Now, if you look at this one, look at the gap up here. This lid just doesn't seal properly. 
and the result is that it, for light, like for its original purpose, this would be fine. This would, this is for things like storing beads or I don't know buttons or um, other things that you, you would use in craft type projects. But surface mount parts are so small that you just can't get away with a gap like that. You'll end up with it's like trying to put confetti in a sieve. <laughs> it's not going to hold it. So the result is that in this particular container, the idea was that I was going to populate this and put all the different parts in it, but it ended up not being useful. And then with things like this, so you can see these shocky diodes, I've actually got a bag inside the container and then the bag has the diodes in it, which uh, kind of defeats the purpose to some extent. Maybe what I need to do is buy uh, you know like an empty one of these you can buy these boxes empty the companies that make the packaging that are used for these resistor kits you can just buy the uh, the package i could just buy one of those the problem is that those holes are a little bit small to hold anything really unusual and uh, uh, some of the well these aren't too bad but some of the unusual parts just won't fit in that sort of thing in the little one uh, yeah Mako said the lids material is too long yes exactly so it ends up warping all yeah, right so how else do I store stuff one thing that I've seen a lot of people use are the little 3d printed tape holders and um, I keep thinking I should print a couple of those and use them, but I haven't. And I think because it wouldn't really fit very well into my own particular use case. I mean, they're super useful for other people. Just trying to think of a, um, a way of explaining that. Okay, so the tape that comes on the pick and place machine uh, can, if you have just a short length of it, so you've got a couple of hundred resistors, it's going to be about that long. It's long enough that it's annoying to store, but you can roll it up and put it inside a little plastic container, which is like a dispenser, and then you can just pull the end of the tape. And it's like a, conceptually, it's like, you know, a sticky tape dispenser, except typically they are square and you pull the tape and the cover tape can be peeled off and then you can take parts out of it. But I find that I don't tend to store short lengths of tape with parts very often. Most of the time it's either loose stuff, like what I was just showing you, or it's complete reels. So, oh, and the other thing I have, which kind of solves that problem, the real problem. Oh, excuse me, I'm, even two weeks later, I'm still not properly recovered from this thing. I'm still having trouble breathing. So this is a really, really dodgy reel holder. So the idea with this is that you can put reels across here and you pull the tape out the front and you can peel back the cover tape and then use this as a pickup location. So if we come back to here, you get a better view of it there. So this is 100 nanofarad capacitors, as you can see. So if you're doing a hand assembly job, what you would do is load up the parts that you want on here. This would sit on your bench, like it might sit back there a little bit out of the way and imagine this is the board I'm assembling. So then you could use either a vacuum pickup or, well, tweezers are difficult into tape. They don't really work very well because you've got to get into the little cavity, but you could use a vacuum uh, pickup and you go pick stick it on the board, pick, stick it on the board. So that's one possible solution as well. And there's also the carousel system that Unexpected Maker has done, which is, um, which is also very cool. Just chuck this back out of the way. So Sion system is like a little Lazy Susan sort of arrangement. It's a round uh, platform with a series of compartments around it. So that what you do is you put your PCB in the middle and then you have different parts in the compartments 
and you just rotate it so that you can pick it up easily. Uh, yeah. Oh, and Dodgy said, if only they made a machine to do that. Yes. So, hopefully that answers how do you store SMT components. Uh, James O, and also I should point out, these questions are from ages ago. Let's see, 12th yeah, of the 9th. These questions are from more than a month ago, which shows how far behind I am on Discord. So I apologize for that. And uh, so James asked, and I think this is a question that I've answered previously on the live stream. And he said, how has COVID impacted your consulting business versus your Freetronics and Superhouse store? Uh, the very short answer, I won't go into it in great detail now, is that the online sales have dropped dramatically and consulting has increased dramatically, which is really cool, actually. Uh, I'm not shipping as many packages and, uh, and doing the consulting work is, it's more interesting, quite apart from the fact that I get paid for it, which is nice. Selling products, I don't really make much margin. So from a financial point of view, it's not even really worth doing it. But um, for consulting, I typically get paid by the hour and that's increased. So that's good. Um, Daryl has a, a question which I'm not qualified to answer, but I'm going to throw it out here because there are people watching who probably are very qualified to answer that which is how critical is calibration to energy measure recordings, particularly over large periods? So, uh, one of those questions is, uh, Dana, well, thanks for dropping in. Um, have a great Sunday. Uh, so, calibration. I suppose from, it depends on whether you are thinking about energy monitoring from a, from a billing point of view or more from an insight and observability point of view. For me personally, I don't actually really care about calibration because it's all about proportionality. If I know that a certain percentage of energy is being used on um, heating or whatever, then that sort of information allows you to make decisions about optimizing what you're doing with the energy. I don't necessarily need to have it. I mean, for me, for energy monitoring, if it was, you know, 10% accurate, that would probably be fine because it's still indicative. It wouldn't even need to be a specific number like uh, X kilowatt hours the units are almost arbitrary as long as you can compare different things within your house and see, oh yeah, that is where all of the energy is going. So it could be measured in magic pixies or something. That's really the important thing. Uh, so, um, yeah, oh, this is a really interesting question, also from Daryl. This is probably something that I would want to get into in a bit more detail, maybe more detail than I would do today, which is, I see many YouTube channels talk about microcontrollers these days and connecting sensors and things, less pure hardware projects. For example, Adafruit have Stemmer. In the past, you would put an op amp on a board to use a PIR. Now you just get a module. Or you could design a power supply, now you just drop a buck converter module in. Do you think the art and skill of debugging pure hardware is getting lost? Um, I think there is a huge scope for educational content around that, uh, that basic electronics. And this comes down to a question that has come up in, the, in relation to organizing the Open Hardware Miniconf as well. And what we're seeing with the Open Hardware Miniconf is that the idea is that we're taking a bunch of software people and introducing them to hardware. And there are a few ways you can do that. One, and there are a few barriers to it. 
One is the barrier of soldering. And soldering is not as hard as a lot of people think it is. And certainly not to do basic things. And so part of it is demystifying that and making people realize that you can go out and buy a, you know, even a $15 soldering iron and make basic connections and build something that works. So it's getting people past that mental hurdle of thinking that that's too hard for them to do. Uh, and so part of the point of the Open Hardware Miniconf is giving people the opportunity to experience things like soldering in a safe and controlled environment where there's someone that they can ask if they have questions. And it might sound like I'm getting off the topic of what the original question was, but this is just a different aspect to it. So one way we could deal with that is that we could bring in software people and have them connect some modules together and, uh, and have a device that works at the end of the day. And you can understand that at a, a system architecture level, it's really like a flow chart. You can see there is this block, which is the voltage regulator, and this block is this particular sensor. And they are linked together, but you don't necessarily understand how the blocks work. Now, there are two ways you can approach the education, uh, the educational aspect of this. You can do a top-down approach, or you can do a bottom-up approach. With the top-down approach, you're looking at this overall architecture. So you're saying, this is the complete system, and these are the things that do the different parts of the job, and then how they are linked together. And then you get lower and lower down into it. So you, you might just take the, uh, the voltage regulator um, on faith, essentially. You're cargo colting it, and you're saying, I've got this block, this part of the system, which is the voltage regulator. I don't understand how it works, but I know it works. So we'll just use it. And you might look into another part of the problem, another part of the system, and learn more about the specific parts that are within it. So you're working down, down, down to get down towards the individual component level. The other way of doing this from an educational point of view is starting from the bottom up. And that is starting with what is a resistor? What is a transistor? What is a capacitor? Going through all of these sorts of things and then um, building up more and more complex systems, starting with the most simple elements and expanding out. Now, the thing is that the way I learned was more of that second approach. And that's really the approach that things like Dick Smith's Fun Way into Electronics uh, took it. They would start with, uh, yeah, they would start with a basic circuit. Like in Funway Volume 1, Project 1, the very first thing is a couple of transistors, a couple of resistors, a couple of capacitors. Well, you're already up to six parts, I think, in it, in the, uh, the basic one by default. And you uh, are building a blinking LED. So even from back in the 1970s or early 80s or whenever this was, the first hardware project was still blink. <laughs> It was just done all in hardware, no microcontroller, no firmware involved. But then by understanding from on that really, really simple circuit, how the different components work in the context of that circuit, you can then build up and create more and more complex things. So that's the bottom up approach to education. And I, um, Oh, I don't actually know which is better. <laughs> but what I've noticed is missing is that bottom-up approach. If you look at most tutorials these days, and I think it's partly because you can build very complex things very quickly by taking a modular approach, looking at the system level, and then going down. But I think what has been lost to some extent are those low-level tutorials. There, I mean, there are places around. There are YouTube channels and there are online tutorials and places you can go and learn about what is a resistor and how does it affect your circuit and those sorts of really fundamental things. But a lot of people coming into electronics from the hobby point of view start with, I have a, a working microcontroller board that I bought for $5 or $10 
it's got USB on it, I can plug it into my computer and by loading some firmware I can now make the outputs go up and down and I can read inputs. But even the simple circuit itself of the board with a microcontroller on it is still a mystery. You, you could look at it and say, I know it's got these headers, that's where I connect stuff. There's a USB socket, that's where it gets its power and where I talk to it. But all the parts on the board, I don't know what they are, I don't know what they do. And I would, this is a, a thing that I've been thinking about a lot recently. And it's a subject that I raised recently when we were talking about the, um, the topics to cover in the upcoming Open Hardware MiniConf. So January 2021, it'll be if the MiniConf is accepted. Uh, so, um, yeah, Unexpected Makers made the, the very good point. It's an issue of time. Bottom-up learning takes a lot of time and commitment, time to learn slowly and time to experiment. Yes, and you don't get the immediate reward. So I think that is why there is so much popularity for the, the top-down sort of approach at the moment. And the thing is that I'm not an educator, so I've, uh, I'm not a teacher. I don't know anything about teaching methods and the best ways of conveying information. So there's, I'm sure there is a huge amount of research and knowledge from, uh, from teachers about the best way to go about this. But what I would like to do is provide some more little bite-sized pieces of content that help people if they do want to look into... So even if you're coming from the top-down approach and you're looking at the overall system and you've got these major blocks that talk to each other and you want to know what's inside those blocks, it can sometimes be hard to find that information. And I think that is where uh, it would be useful to have a bit more content. All right. Uh, I saw a comment just a moment ago. Yeah, Andy said you don't need to choose. You can and should do both top down and bottom up at the same time. So many awesome online resources for both. Oh, and there's a link to Righto. I don't know Righto. Thanks, Andy. I'm going to check that out. Uh, open link. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm not going to sit here and look at web pages while you watch me look at web pages. Oh, that's Ken Sheriff's blog. Okay. Yes. I have seen Ken Sheriff's blog many times, so uh, I don't know why, but I I thought his the URL was like sheriff.com. Anyway, uh, yeah, so back to questions, and let's see, where was I up to? Uh, oh, yes, okay, so one other comment that I just saw a little while ago in the the live chat. Um, what I'm looking at at the moment in terms of questions is the stuff that's on Discord, but I'm also half keeping an eye on the live chat as well. And um, Rodolf uh, Quisnard, I think that I hope that's how you pronounce your name, said, "I miss your various detailed video about Sonoff hacks and security." Yes. Um, so. <laughs> I really want to do more videos. It's, uh, I, I do really enjoy these live streams, but I also want to get uh, proper edited videos out there. And um, I just, um, I just haven't been able to for various reasons. All right, so. <clears throat> Uh, J.P. Simmons said, uh, I do not know about getting lost, but certainly going the way of PCs, vehicles, and most other things, most people just drop in a replacement card or assemble it. They do not know how it works together. You get another stratification of people that know how to find which card or component is giving trouble, and further down, and much lesser in number, several, or several orders of magnitude at a guess, are those who can actually debug the cards. It's simply further specialization. Yeah, that comment really directly goes to what I was talking about with top-down versus bottom-up education. And also I should point out that I'm not saying that knowledge at any level in the system is any better than knowledge at any other level of the system. Being able to do system-level diagnostics and debugging is 
a really, really useful skill. So, uh, so part of it is that you need to find the area that you're interested in and learn more about how things work at that level. It's not that it's better to know more at the lower level. I'm not necessarily saying that at all. I'm a lot of the time doing system level debugging and figuring out where the problem is at a block level is, uh, is a very useful thing and the fastest way to solving the problem. So, yeah. <clears throat> this just goes to show how far back I am in the Discord questions. Doug said, has anyone mentioned daylight saving starts tonight? So tomorrow's stream is an hour earlier, depending on where you are. <laughs> yeah, that was a few weeks ago. <laughs> uh, all right. Oh, here's a good one. Uh, Qtronic said, are you thinking to generate a 3D model like an STL or STEM of your boards? Because I would like to make 3D printed case or brackets for some of the shields, like the IO Breakout, IO VR RJ45. Or if I could get Superhouse Parts Libraries for Eagle, I would do it myself faster and easier. Yeah, so that is something that I've... For a little while, I went on this thing where every week... What was it? I think it was Thursdays. I used to do 3D Thursday. And my objective was to generate a 3D model of a Freetronics or a Superhouse board, one per week. And then I was posting screenshots on Twitter of like 3D renders of existing boards. And um, uh, I kind of stopped doing that. But what I would like to do is output a model of the board. And the thing is that it's actually really easy to do. This is just something I need to be more conscious of. On the product pages, I've tried to put on resources. Like if I go to, let's see, Superhouse IORJ45, because this is one of the boards that was mentioned in that particular question. Oh, and look, it says, not found. <laughs> I can't even find a thing on my own site. IORJ45. Let's see if I can find it. Oh, yes, here we go. Okay, so I know you can't see what I'm looking at right at this moment. I'm just pulling up some information to talk about what I should do here. Resources. Okay, now if I switch to desktop and you can see this page. So we've got here the page for the IO breakout to RJ45 connectors. And there's not a whole lot of information here. There's a little description, some features. There is the description and pinout guide. What is that? <laughs> I don't even remember doing that. Oh, okay, that's the general page about the IO breakout header. So this is just like a convention that I use on quite a few different boards. I've got shields and modules and things in relation to it. So I did that page to, ex uh, to explain the breakout. But back to the product. And there is a link here to design files. Now, the thing is that if you simply grab these design files, which eventually will take us to GitHub. So this has got the, uh, the Eagle file, so board and schematic and there's an eagle project file from here you can because eagle embeds the part footprints and things when you export a uh, when you save the project but what it doesn't do is at least i assume it doesn't <laughs> i think it would be a bit silly if it did it doesn't include the 3d model for the parts that are in the project so if you don't have the original library you can't just sync to Fusion 360 and have a 3D model of your board. You need the original library. So there are a couple of things I can do. I could um, and should share my Eagle libraries. So that would help. Uh, but what I should also do is just generate those models. So do I have... Fusion 360 running? I don't know. No, I don't. Okay. 
I will in about five minutes anyway. <laughs> um, I think it's thinking about starting Fusion 360. Maybe, eventually. And uh, then we can have a look at that. We might have to come back to that because Fusion will take a while to launch. So... Uh, you'll have to excuse me for a second because I need to grab this. I am really still suffering the final lingering after effects of, uh, of this problem I had from the solar fumes. So I'm going to throw you to, what do I throw you to? Something interesting. Uh, desktop and no throw to overhead overhead and i'm going to mute you for a second sorry about that I had to blow my nose and I didn't think you should all be subjected to that too much other than the little thing up on the corner of the screen there. So what we've got is uh, uh, did Fusion ever launch? What happened to that? I don't know if it did. Let's see. Fusion. Oh. My computer thinks Fusion 360 is running. Oh, there it is. It's on a different screen. Okay. Let's bring it back over this way. And go into... What have I got? Superhouse modules. Let's see if I have a model in here. So when I do something like the IORIJ45... IORBR Mega... It's got to be there. There it is. Alright. So if you wanted to make a case around the IO RJ45 it would be very useful to have access to this model so this is the um, this is the breakout in Fusion 360 so there are a couple of things I can do one is I could just export this whole F3D project and I really should do that in fact, let's... No, no, I won't do it now while you're watching. But what I should do is progressively, over time, go through the different... Um... <laughs> I am so not with it today. I, my brain is struggling with this. I didn't even have the right, <laughs> the right camera view. So... Uh... What I can do is export this as an F3D file so that you could then bring this in and um, build your own case around it and use this to, you know, use this as a tool to cut a hole into the front panel or however you wanted to approach it. And I could also save it as like a, an STL or some useful conversion format like that because not everybody uses Fusion 360. So if you wanted to use uh, like OpenCAD or OpenSCAD or whatever it is, um, you could pull in something like an STL. So anyway, let's not do that right now. But that is definitely a very good suggestion. And uh, I really do need to focus more on putting content up on these pages. Because if you look at this particular page, which has got the IO breakout to RJ45 on it. There's not very much here in GitHub. It's just got this little thing that says what it is with a link back to the page, which is going to be broken. <laughs> oh. I think I need caffeine or something today. <laughs> I'm struggling. <clears throat> I've been so tired after the last few weeks of being sick so um, let's go back to 
checking these questions in Discord. Uh, where was I? So 3D models, yeah. So Qtronic, thank you very much for that suggestion. Uh, I'd need to do that. So what I think I'd like to do is generate Fusion 360 and STL files and then add them to the project pages. That would really help. Um, oh, and Planes203 said, wondering if there is an option for early access Ether Uno and what the estimated availability of the final release is likely to be. Um, there isn't really an option for early access and the only thing holding it up now is me placing the order for a production run. So, I, where did it go? I had one here somewhere. <laughs> Ether Uno, there it is. I can see the box. I've got a few different versions in here, so... Oh yeah, so this is the the like production version of the Ether Uno. And uh, at the moment this is the only one in existence. So I'm not sharing. Sorry. <laughs> I'm keeping this one to myself. I did get a little pack of PCBs. Um, where is it? This one. So I've got another four PCBs there. I could hand assemble a couple more, but what I really need to do is just put these into production and get the factory working on them. Uh, unfortunately, that means fronting up how much? About $5,000, I think it is, to do a production run. So uh, I need to be careful about <laughs> shelling out that sort of money. You know, doing the economics of producing uh, producing hardware like this it's very lumpy uh, so what if, if I want to produce a batch of these like say 140 typically 144 is the quantity that I use for many of these or multiples of 144 so it might be like 288 or whatever to do a batch a production run of ether Uno's it's going to be <clears throat> uh, I haven't actually run the numbers, but it's going to be somewhere like in the four to five thousand dollar region, and then that stock ends up being sitting on sitting on the shelf for a while, and then I'll sell it and I'll make the money back, but I've got to front up the money in the first place <clears throat> to do the production run. So that's just something I haven't got to yet. I've been slowly accumulating funds in my. Um, in my bank account so I can pay for a production run. Mm. Uh, yeah, oh, Sarek said, uh, this is a suggestion for a topic to cover. Perhaps going, in, going to using switches, <clears throat> similar or the same as standard 240 volt ones with a light switch controller in some more detail, as mentioned already across a few of the other channels. What would be cool is a fallback mode in the microcontroller that if networked MQTC fails, it uses a pre-configured association. Yeah, so I am, I'm looking around because I've got something just down here that, uh, no, I won't bother pulling it out. There's other stuff stacked on top of it. So to explain this a little bit more, just to give a bit of background to Sarek's suggestion slash question. For the light switches, in fact, one thing I can easily get to is this. This makes a pretty good prop anyway. So this is the simple home automation switch. So this is a four button system. It's got the PCB on the back with the little socket on there so you can plug the cable into it. And it takes power and illuminates the buttons. And then when you press the button, it just sends a signal down the wire. Now what I've been thinking about doing is making a version of this PCB which has got holes to match the back of a standard power, uh, like a standard 240 volt light switch. So what you could do right now is by using a, a couple of bits of cable, you could connect it into the back of the light switch and solder it onto the holes in the PCB here, which are meant for using these buttons. 
So you could use one of these breakouts and convert a regular uh, toggle type light switch to being an automation switch. The major difference of course is that these are momentary. So they're normally open, you press them, they close briefly, you let go, and they open again. Whereas a toggle switch is either open or closed depending on the position it's in. So there needs to be a change in the software. I did actually talk about this a couple of weeks ago when I was going into the, the whole thing of the new light switch. But um, I want to make it easy for people to do that. And with the new light switch controller, uh, the new rack mount one, in the firmware what I'm planning to do is have an option so that for any of the inputs you can just say whether it is a button or a switch. The same as you can do in Tasmoda. So in Tasmoda you can have an input to a device, like into a Sonoff, and you can specify whether it's a button, in which case it's momentary, or a switch, in which case it changes state. And on each state change, you need to be able to change the output. So uh, that's just a little flag, uh, and very, very simple to implement in software. So the idea is that what I want to be able to do is have regular uh, mains light switches on the wall connected to the UTP cable, have it go to the light switch controller and um, and have it understand that for those particular ones when it changes state that's when you need to toggle the output. Mm, right. Um, ooh, Daryl, uh -huh. thank you very much for putting this in. So. Uh, Daryl just put a link in uh, in relation to what I was talking about earlier with SMTP part SM why am I saying SMTP today I've done that several times and I've got no idea why my why I'm doing that SMT so these are storage boxes I'm gonna chuck a link into the uh, no I'll just bring it up on here come on Got to bring this over onto this screen, switch to desktop. Okay, so what we're looking at here are parts cases, but these are basically empty cases, I think. Do they come from? Yeah, so that seems pretty expensive, actually. Oh, two units. Okay, so two cases. It's US $41. Let's see. 41, 144, they've got a few different sizes here. Oh, okay. This is interesting. They've got other versions that have got much bigger, uh, much bigger compartments in them, which could be useful for other things. So this is really just, uh, this is what I was mentioning earlier about the, the parts boxes, these ones here, buying just the box on its own with nothing in it. And you can get them in all these different sizes. So hmm, there are some here that look like they've got black. Why is that? I don't know. Some of them are, are gray, some of them are black. But I don't know what the difference is. If I read the description, I would probably figure it out. Yeah, you can see better views in the photos there anyway. So there are a whole lot of the difference between static dissipative or clear versus not clear who knows but if you want to store parts that looks like a good option yeah cool thanks for that link Daryl yeah and as Daryl said good thing is they have different sizes all right now ah <sighs> Uh, let me see, does mute work? I need a drink of caffeine. Mm, maybe that will wake me up again. Maybe not. I think I just need more sleep. Alright, <clears throat> so. Let's see what there is in the chat uh, okay uh, 
Ooh, uh, Electron Ash. <laughs> so there's some chat going on about resistor books. In fact, okay, here's another example. I didn't pull this down because I very rarely use this. Let's go to here. This is an 0402, is it? Yes, 0402 resistors book. And you open it up and it's got all of these little pages with short strips of resistors. And you can go through and all the different values. So it's got a few of each value in here. How many are there? I have no idea. It doesn't look like many. Maybe 40 or something per 50 of each different value. So if you just want to use, um, so this has got both resistors and capacitors. Down the back here, these are capacitors. Like 22 picofarad. You can see the values stamped in there. You peel out the bit of, you pull a bit of tape out and then peel back the cover, use the parts out of it, put the tape back in the book. So as you can see, this book has not been used. It's been sitting up there for a long time. All of these are complete tapes. And when, in places where these books are used, they end up being, becoming pretty ratty like you end up with bits of tape which have been partly used and it's all a bit all over the place I'm not really a huge fan of these I'm not even sure why I have this one I bought it at some point and it sits just up here next to all of the other parts even though I um, don't generally use it so that book I just showed you was 0402 resistors what I reach for instead is this one which is the 0402 resistors in the box. I just find the boxes are much easier to deal with. With the resistor books, you've got to pull the tape out and peel back the cover, and it's, uh, it's just annoying. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Magic Blue Smokes it. I must be the odd one out. I've never found a use for one of those books. Yeah, yes, why, well, as you can see, mine has never been used. Not that particular one, anyway yeah so uh oh s lanahart said any news on the ether 10 there are plenty of ether 10s right now i did a production run i ran two a batch of 288 and they are in stock right now but i may not end up doing any more runs than that depending on the timing of the ether uno if i do a production run of that soon I might just phase out the Ether 10, but one of the things, what goes through my head with this is I hate end of life products because there are so many people that become dependent on a particular thing. Now the Ether 10 and the Ether Mega in particular are two boards that I make that end up being designed into other things. And, um, and I know that there are, like, I've got customers that will place order for things like Ether Megas and they might order 50 at a time because they've designed a product that takes the Ether Mega and they just plug it in and it takes care of everything that they need. So if I do things like change the position of the connectors, it could mess up their enclosure design. Uh, there are all sorts of things like that now uh, that are a... Um, they kind of lock me into not changing things and sometimes that is a real uh yeah it's a real shackle around your legs it just stops you from being able to move forward so part of the reason for going for the the major change with the ether uno is that i can so the ether uno conceptually is it's really just an updated version of the Ether 10. If you know, um, uh, if if you mm, sorry, lost my train of thought. This is going to go down in history as the worst live stream ever. Maybe I should just get drunk or something. I should take up drinking. <laughs> um, get drunk on live stream. It would probably be more entertaining. Uh, if 
If you look at the versions of the Ether 10, starting from version 1, it's gone through a number of iterations, and there have been some changes. The very first Ether 10 had mini USB on it, and then at some point it got switched over, I think it was version 2.0, to micro USB. There are a couple of other minor changes to it, but for the most part, it has been those little incremental changes. And going from the Ether 10 version, I think it's 3.0 at the moment, or 3.1, to the Ether Uno, which is really the, um, it, it really is another increment. The Ethernet socket is in the same place, the SD card socket is in the same place, and that's deliberate. I've been trying to keep the, those sorts of things consistent. Um, but I've changed to USB C, the uh, the Ethernet chip has changed from the Wiznet W5100 to the 5500 and there have been a couple of changes like that which are significant enough that if you have designed the Ether 10 into a product and you've been buying it for years and putting it inside your existing product and then you place an order for an Ether 10 or like say you order 50 Ether 10s and the box arrives and you open them up and all of a sudden it's hang on, this has got USB-C on it and the connector is in a slightly different place to before and it's a W5500 so our pre-compiled binary isn't going to work on it, we need to compile again for the new target Ethernet chip. Uh, that could make some people angry. So, so that's partly the reason actually for changing the name. It's a way of signifying this is the Ether10, this is the Ether Uno, one is the successor to the other, but you wouldn't um, unwittingly order a batch of Ether Unos without realizing that something has changed. It's an indicator that, hey, we, in the past we've been buying Ether 10s, Ether Uno is conceptually a drop-in replacement for it, but there are some differences. And we can't just um, use our existing process to push the same binary into it that we were using on the Ether 10. We're going to have to recompile it and now we need a different cable to plug into it because it's USB-C, all of those sorts of things. So the change in name from Ether 10 to Ether Uno is to signify that difference. But what I might end up doing is continuing production of, ETH, of the Ether 10 if necessary. And I'm kind of going to play this by ear. So if I do a production run now of the Ether Uno and on the Ether 10 webpage, I put a notice there saying this product is end of life. Um, you know, we've got the stock count there, so you can see how many are left. Once it runs out of, uh, once I run out of stock, that's it. And from then, you have to buy the Ether Uno. But if if a customer came to me and said, "We've designed your product into our product, and we need another 200 of them," then oh, well, I'd do a production run for them. So I suppose that's. Uh, that's a way around it. And uh, oh, Jordan Rees said, put a last time buy notice to those who have bought more than five in the last two years. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I could do a search through my e-commerce system and find customers that have bought Ether 10s and send them an email or something. I just don't want to overstep and spam. <laughs> so yeah, I'll have to think about doing that. Uh, I think maybe make if i make it really super clear on the page for the ether 10 what the situation is then it should be okay so if people want more ether 10s the, the only problem is of course the delay so if someone uh if someone came along to the ether 10 page expecting to be able to buy 50 of them and all of a sudden it's going to, they, there's no stock which means i've got to do a custom production runs which means they've got to wait six weeks for it instead of having it shipped out the same day then uh yeah <laughs> that's just unfortunately that's what would happen oh and andrew ruthman suggested hey andrew hey good to see you here uh set a minimum order quantity yeah that's possible uh electron ash said it could be worth looking into adding ethernet to the esp32 i think it has the interface for an ethernet fi chip yes it does so the ESP32 has an onboard Ethernet controller 
and you just need the Phi added to it, uh, like the physical interface chip. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, Station 240 had a cool suggestion. Um, if they bought 50 plus, offer to give them an Ether Uno to try out. Yeah, that's, that's a nice idea. Send them a free Ether Uno when they're available and uh, see if they want to can use that instead. That's uh, that's worth doing. Uh, so back to Electron Ash's thing. So uh, adding Ethernet to the ESP32. Yes, uh, this is a subject that has come up quite a few times and it's something that I haven't yet done but I keep thinking about it. There are a very there are various projects where it would be useful to have an ESP32 for all of the goodness that it has, like the performance and Wi-Fi and all of those other things combined with Ethernet. And there are boards like the WESP32 that already do it. Uh, but I've been thinking that there are a number of projects I've had where I've thought it would be really useful to add Ethernet to this and do it with an ESP32. It's just that I, those particular projects, I haven't got to the point of doing boards yet. So, uh, yes. Oh, Johnny uh, Bergdahl said, I have two WESP 32s. Yeah, uh, I've got WESP 32s as well. They are cool. All right. Um, uh, oh, hang on. <laughs> this is going so far off topic that, ah, oh, yes. Uh, I'm just reading back through the, um, the, the thing. This is totally off topic, and I don't know how this came up in the chat. I must have missed something. <laughs> Dodgy Brothers Engineering said, uh, responding to Johnny Bergdahl, yes, I must say I was something blown, somewhat blown away by the disturbed version after hearing the original. It was kind of a wow moment. And uh, <laughs> that's because Johnny said, the only music I had any reaction to in the last 10 years was when Disturbed made the sound of silence. Uh... Yes. I've got to say, I'm not really that much into music. Like, if someone asked me what my favorite type of music was or whatever, I couldn't really answer. Um, some music I like, some I don't. I don't. I'm not really a music sort of person. But I've got to say, when I saw, uh, yeah, Disturbed version of The Sound of Silence, that, yeah, that just blew me away. It is amazing. I can't believe I'm here talking about music. The thing that I am least qualified to talk about and have the, uh, the, um, <laughs> have almost no opinions about. But there are some things when you come across them, they just make you stop and listen. And, uh, yeah, Disturbed's performance of The Sound of Silence. If you haven't heard it before, go and check it out on YouTube. Just search for The Sound of Silence, Disturbed. It brings an incredible level of intensity to that song. All right. Oh, <laughs> since we are now chasing that squirrel, uh, something, another thing I heard which had a similar reaction to me was the first time that I heard um, uh, Mongolian throat singing. Uh, yeah, there was a, a song that was, I uh, got a bit of airplay uh, a couple of years ago now. I can't even remember what it's called. I could find it again, but I won't because <laughs> that is so far off topic. Uh, but yeah, Mongolian throat singing is, uh, if you liked Disturbed's version of The Sound of Silence, look up Mongolian throat singing. Alrighty. Um, so, uh, oh, Dodgy Brother said, been into audio for many decades, biggest money drain in my house. Yeah, it's something that I've never really set up. So, I don't really have any way other than my phone and things like um, the speakers in She Who Shall Not Be Named. I've got a Bluetooth speaker up here. I've never really set myself up for playing music 
because it's not really something that's mattered to me much. But I listen to podcasts constantly. Like I've, I'm just... Any time that I'm doing other things, I normally have a podcast on in the background. If it's something that I can do repetitively, like assembling boards, I'll put on a podcast that requires me to think about it and actually pay act and listen actively. Uh, otherwise, I'll just put on a podcast that can be in the background and I don't have to think about it too much and I can just ignore it. Yeah. <laughs> um... Yeah, Dodgy said, I've spent tens of thousands on audio and visual gear. Big passion for me. Yeah. And I do appreciate it when I hear it. And I know many people are audiophiles who really enjoy uh, good quality audio reproduction. And it can, it can sound amazing, but it's just not something that I have put the time and effort into. Yeah. Um, oh, cool. Dentistry said, already been designing circuits using the Ether Uno as a reference design. <laughs> That's nice to know. So, um, oh, that actually brings up something that, uh, uh, this has got me a couple of times recently. I've, the way I work in general in terms of designing things is that I tend to immediately go to being public. So if I'm working on a design for something, it won't necessarily be finished yet and it'll already be up on GitHub. And what happens is I get people contacting me saying um, things like, uh, why can't I buy this? Or um, telling me, you know, this is incomplete. <laughs> That's, yes, I know. It's because I'm sharing the process with you. I know that a lot of people prefer to finish the design for something and have it totally ready and then release it. But uh, I, I don't know. I just tend to, to put things up publicly. And if it's useful to other people, then that's fantastic. Because so much of what I've learned has been by looking at other people's designs. It's, it's like that whole thing about learning to do HTML by going to a web page and then doing view source and then figuring out how it works. It's looking inside things to see how other people have solved problems and sometimes just cargo culting their solution, just copying it and saying, oh, works for them, so I'll do the same thing, even though I don't really understand the reasoning behind it or the design decisions or how they arrived at that solution. And sometimes it's looking into the design of it and really digging into it and trying to understand how something works. But in any case, it all starts with sharing and with putting designs out there. So uh, sometimes it bites me because I will put something up there that is incomplete and then I change my mind and go for a different design decision and then um, <laughs> people will contact me and say, why did you change that? It's, well, it's because you were looking at a draft. It wasn't a fully finished product. It wasn't something that was 100% yet. But for the Ether Uno, the version that is currently on GitHub should be the version that is in that box just there. Oh, that one right there. It should be exactly what is going into production. Uh, but I am a, I'm often a little bit wary of making changes to things because it's this um, it's this feeling that I've put this up there and people are already taking that and using it in some way and then if I rethink things and change the design then their forks of that are going to uh, they're not going to become irrelevant but it becomes harder to collaborate so Anyway, that's attention. And I do get those messages reasonably regularly. I get people who, um, like I'll start a design and I think part of the problem as well is that because I do lots and lots of different projects and then don't necessarily put them into production at all, I, I might work on a design, maybe build a prototype, put all my design files on GitHub, but then for whatever reason, uh, I don't put it into production. And an example of this is the 
the Wi-Fi interface board that I designed a couple of years ago for the AXA electric window motors. So the electric windows that I have in my house have a LIN bus interface on them and a battery compartment. So you can either control them with an infrared remote control and put batteries in it so it's totally self-contained or you can run cable to it and use LIN bus for control. So what I did was design an ESP8266 based board which is a really weird shaped PCB and it fits, in fact I wonder if I've got it in here, I probably do. I'm going to see if I've got that in Fusion 360. Uh, I, yeah, I do. Let's have a look at this. In fact, I've got two different versions of it. There's a, um, a version that uses an ESP01 module and there's a version that uses the, um, uses an ESP12E, I think it is, ESP12, one of those. Anyway, this is it. So this is a weird little shaped board that, oh look, there's some weird stuff going on. The 3D model for these capacitors is all messed up and the, uh, the leads are a little bit longer than reality. So the reason that this board has got these two slots in it is that well, my intention was that this would clip into the battery compartment in place of the four, I think it's four, AA batteries double-A cells that would normally go in there and there is a little plastic clip that goes through the battery compartment to hold the cells in place so the slots need to be there to fit down over those clips now the thing is that mechanically this doesn't fit very well and in fact I've had these boards fabricated I've got them in a box right here I have never put this into production what's the date on this oh, it says version 1.1 2018. Okay, so a couple of years ago I designed this. In fact, it might be, um, might have even been earlier than that when I did the first version of this. And when I was working with this, I put it up on GitHub right from the time that I started on it. Yeah, here's another version. I only can see some dodgy <laughs> rendering here because the modules, hang on, I'm trying to get it at the right angle to be bad. There we go, we've got some dodgy rendering there. It's because I don't have 3D footprints set up properly for those parts. When is this one? Also 2018? 2017! Yeah, see, so this one was 2017. This is the version with the ESP01 module, and you can see there's a footprint there where it goes on. Come on. Nope, it doesn't want to. Alright, so anyway, back to the point of this. I was playing around with these ideas, there we go, and I never actually produced or released these boards, but these designs are several years old now, and they've been sitting on GitHub all of that time, and uh, I've had a number of people over the years contact me saying, what's going on with these designs, and why can't I buy it, and well, I am only... Okay, so part of it is that after working on this, I rethought my position on doing things that provide physical access to the house and use Wi-Fi. And um, I mean, maybe I should just produce it because if other people choose to do that, that's fine. But I would prefer not to use Wi-Fi to control something that controls physical access to the house because an electric window motor is essentially the same as like a door lock if you can trigger that mechanism you can just open the window and get into the house it's like you've unlocked the door and if you can do it over wi-fi hey fantastic so uh, i kind of lost interest i was experimenting with this idea and then i saw some other squirrel and started trying chasing that instead and I just lost interest in this so I never really followed up on it other than messing around with the other version of it which is this one here and I did produce prototypes so I physically have a, um, a prototype of this that I can use and test but the other thing is that I discovered mechanically that it didn't fit properly inside the battery compartment so I would have in order to make this actually useful I would have to read design this a bit 
because just because of the shape of the way things come over here, I'd need to flatten the voltage regulator, like lay it on its side and make a few other changes to it. And so the combination of not being particularly motivated to finish the project along with having problems to solve meant that I just put that aside. Never actually did anything with it. Uh, and it's really there kind of as a, I suppose one way of thinking about it is that it's like, it's a draft or an experiment. And if someone else wants to continue the experiment, go for it. You're most welcome to. The design files are there. You can grab them, you can edit them, and do whatever you like. It's all under an open license. Uh, but I just haven't had the time slash inclination to pursue taking the next steps that would be required to modify this design and make it fit properly and then do all the testing, put it into production and sell it for a board that's going to have a very, very niche market. <laughs> I mean, how many people have AXA electric window motors and want to convert them to Wi-Fi? It must be like a market of about three people in the world. Uh, so anyway, maybe there is latent demand out there <laughs> and I'm ignoring <clears throat> the project that could turn me into a bazillionaire, but I don't think so. So if people want to use it, they can. But anyway, the point of all of this was that I have many, many projects on GitHub, not all of which are fully in production. Many of them are like this. They are, it's 90% there. And technically this thing works. Electrically it works. It just doesn't fit in the battery compartment very well. Just because of the shape of the way the tabs come through these slots and the way the, the cover closes over the top of it. It's, it's not really anything too bad. I could, you know, I could do that last little bit of uh, the design, change it, generate new production files, and uh, yeah, <laughs> but there are other things to do, like light switches. So many projects, so many projects. Now, um, yeah, I dodgy just said I do plan to put in electric windows, but I'm not sure I could bring myself to do it wirelessly. Yes. Um, Oh, Electron Ash, be right back, feed break. Bring me something, please. I need a snack. Um, oh, cool, James said, I pulled uh, the design files for the RGSAT boards and considered getting a small batch made just for fun. <laughs> yeah, uh, that would be cool. Uh, I wonder if I've got any, hmm. I don't have any blanks or do I? No, I don't think I do. I was just wondering if I had any blank PCBs. They're actually, in fact, if I move, if you look over my shoulder, that out of focus thing right there, that is an RGSAT board because I was just moving stuff around. And um, <laughs> Electron Ash said, you should have a stack of Pop-Tarts or something in the workshop. Yes, I should. <laughs> I should for mornings like this when I need something. So this is a little stack of RGSAT boards in there with their little plastic mounting. Well, that one's a, um, a ground test breakout with a payload processor module stuck on top of it. And then these other ones have got little laser cut plastic things to hold them. And uh, one thing I've been thinking for ages is I would love to make up a wall display with um, with these in it. Oh, proper food, electron ash, or a few boxes of monster munch or pot noodles, <laughs> you know, proper food. Yeah. Uh, so what I've got here is the, this is the very first prototype of the RGSAT payload processor module. You can see it's got bodge wires on it and you can see it's got a short header here. So there is a four pin header for debugging and messing around with <laughs> and you can see I've patched in a right angle header here for ICSP um, and I've actually got three is it three yes I've got three generations or three versions 
of the payload processor module right here. So that is the first prototype. And this is the revised version. Which way does it go? That way. This is the revised version. So this one is exactly, in fact, it's from the same batch as the ones that went into space. So this is, is there, where's the version number on the hardware? Version 1.5. Oh no, that one is not. That one, the, uh, that one is 1.5, which is a more up-to-date one. This one, version 1.2. So V1.0 was never, I mean 1.1 was never actually manufactured. That's version 1.0, first prototype. Version 1.1 was never manufactured. Version 1.2, this one, this is the one that went into space, not this exact board. So there were five of this board ever produced and uh, two of them went into space. One was the, uh, the ground, like the, the flat sat uh, test system uh, at mission control and then I got two of them. So I kept two for my own purposes for development and other things. So this is one. Uh, and it's sitting on the ground test breakout for going into the thermal vacuum chamber for testing. So normally this is where the wiring harness would be connected to go through the side of the vacuum chamber to the instruments for remote managing it while it's in the test chamber. And that's right, this one is more up to date than the version that actually went into space. So, uh, I do have a couple of these. If you are hand assembling it, this board would be a total pain. It's, uh, it's a bunch of 0402 parts, which in themselves are not too bad, but it's got 17 uh, MCUs on it and they are all QFNs, which, as I said before, is not my favorite. <laughs> I dislike it less than BGAs for hand assembly, but um, yeah, still not my favorite thing, assembling QFNs and putting 17 QFNs onto a board. Not fun at all. In fact, there's more than that because there are also, that's, that's only the MCUs. There are 17 MCUs on this PCB. And then there are some other chips as well, which are also QFNs. And even QFNs on the back of the PCB, because it's double-sided load. So if you were doing that just as a fun thing for like, oh, it would be a novelty to build a satellite PCB, it would be a pain. <laughs> Not a fun thing to do at all. Add a, yes, so add a stencil to the order. <laughs> I highly recommend that. <clears throat> Yes, do that with a stencil. Uh, whew, so, anyway, oh, that's right. What I was talking about before was I would... These boards are probably one of the coolest things that I've done in my working career. And so one thing that I was really wanting to do was make up some kind of uh, like a wall display that incorporates the boards and have them powered up in the display. So what I could do is get one of those, you know, the big box frames that are deep. They're not for pictures, but they're like 50 millimeters deep or so, so that you can put uh, three dimensional thing in, things inside it. I could get one of those and put the what I could do is either put the three versions of the hardware that physically exist in it, so I have them all side by side in a row or above each other in a stack, or I could do those and also do, like I could put in the three payload processor modules and also put in something like the um, this uh, satellite power supply module as a fourth, so I could have it like a grid of four modules, put it inside a uh, some kind of a frame, like one of those 3D box frames, and run power through from the back. So what I could do is patch power onto the back of these. And that would be really easy because I could either do it through the headers. There's this um, CubeSat bus header just here. I could patch into that. 
or I could even connect into um, these sockets down here. So you can see the sockets on the back, which is where some of the instruments in the payload were connected and power is exposed on, uh, on those headers. So I could plug into those and power them up. In fact, this one, yeah, just for the fun of it, I'm going to power this up. <laughs> this board is running blink. Uh, 16 times <laughs> with different delays in it. Let's get some power onto it. Uh, get to the overhead camera. Chuck this in. What have we got? I should have power here somewhere. It's, uh, it's a while since I've powered this up, but let's see what happens if I just plug 12 volts in. Hey, look, we've got blinking LEDs. It's a whole lot of blinking LEDs. We'll zoom it in. So each of these MCUs, so you can see there's a big MCU up here. That's the supervisor that manages all the experiments on the satellite. And then each of these little rectangles here contains a processor node. So each one of these could be independently running an experiment using the payload in the satellite, or using the instruments. And what I've done is just flashed each of these with a version of Blink, which is, oh, you can see this one's not running at all. Um, and it's got the delay set to a different period. So the end result is that, like you can see this one over here is really fast in, in node three. These ones in nodes two and six are slower. Like two is very slow. It's got a long delay on it. And so then we're just getting blinking at different rates. <laughs> so there's a, is it RGB? I can't remember. I think this might actually be an RGB LED. So I should make this do different colors. Yeah, it is. It's an RGB LED. I could make that much prettier if I just had it doing different colors or random colors or something. So what I could do, it, like this, at the moment, this board is loaded onto the ground test breakout. And um, that's just a, a way of mechanically mounting it. And then it connects into the CubeSat bus here and breaks it out to these screw terminals so that in this case, all I've got is a little five volt regulator and it's going into the five volt rail on, uh, on, this, uh, on this module. But um, what I could do is just mount this board without the, the ground test breakout and mount it. I, someone earlier just said sports memorabilia frame. Uh, yes, Pancake Legend said sports memorabilia frame. Exactly. Uh, oh, Daryl had a good idea. You could print the schematic as a backdrop. <laughs> the schem maybe part of the schematic a lot of it is very repetitive in fact uh, let's have a look I should be able to pull up part of the schematic for this and where did I um, I've been in the process of restructuring the way I store my projects to unify a lot more information within each project uh, Libresat payload processor module there it is this particular one so open, come on. So a lot of the schematic for this is very repetitive. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so this is the, um, the PCB. Oh, it's still loading. Why is it taking so long to load? It's a kind of complicated project, but not too bad. I'll just turn on some extra layers and uh, run the rat's nest. Come on, you can do it. Computers having trouble keeping up and rip up the rat's nest. Okay, so this is the, the PCB layout for that particular board. And you can see all the different layers there and the schematic is spread across many, many sheets. Come on, where are you, schematic? Why isn't it visible? There it is, okay. So you can see we've got 19 sheets in this schematic. 
uh, but most of them are very similar because it's just the processor nodes repeated over and over. So the first sheet is mostly the I.O. related stuff like the CubeSat bus breakout, current sensors, micro SD, all of those sorts of things. And then there is the management processor uh, with its communications to the different nodes uh, using multiplexes. And then what have we got here? Node reset control, GPS, Spectroino. So that's the spectrum analyzer. And then we've got the processor nodes. So each of the processor nodes looks pretty much the same. Processor node one, and if I flip through this node two, you'll see the number change and not much else. The past designators change, but it's just the same thing over and over again. So yeah, I suppose I could print or maybe combine the sheets so that they're tiled and make some kind of a background to put behind it. Or I could get someone to do some really cool space related artwork or something and put that in the back of the uh, the enclosure. So, uh, oh, Andy suggested background picture is the two CubeSats as they were thrown out of the ISS and visible against the solar panels. Yes, Andy, I think you've got it. That, need, that picture needs to be the background. Uh, I'm going to see if I can find that photo. Uh, do you sat, um... <laughs> oh, isn't this fun? You're watching me use Google. Uh, it might take me a little bit to find the photo. I've got it around somewhere. I am absolutely certain. But yeah, there is a really cool photo. In fact, it was, um, uh, there was a, one space photo of the year award or something, it was a photo of the Arjusat deployment. Um, hmm. It was a photo taken from the cupola of the ISS as the satellites were being deployed. Uh, not that one, no, I'm just looking at space photos now. <laughs> <laughs> which is a fun thing to do but you looking at me looking at photos is not quite a spectator sport oh okay so it's in the wikipedia um thing where is the deployment photo oh yeah there it is oh that's it with the there's a photo of the satellites just against the i'm going to drop this link in as well so if anybody wants to go to the wikipedia article of course they can but this is directly to the photo which is including argusat x and argusat one so in that photo are a couple more of these each of those satellites has one of these pcbs in it which orbited many 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 times and then eventually met their fiery end which is very sad so now there are only three of those pcbs in existence there were five for a while oh yeah so um yeah i thought there was there's another photo as well that that photo shows the satellites against the earth uh, but there is another photo that was taken i think a couple of seconds before that which is when they had left the uh the p pod so the um the payload um the, the dispenser basically the pez dispenser that shoots out satellites instead of lollies as they left the p pod they then passed visually in front of one of the solar arrays and there is a photo which shows them very clearly because it's against the gold sort of background of the solar array it looks really cool uh yeah so uh, yes um i am i think i'm gonna and call this Oh, hang on. Uh, Venetian blinds. Oh, I just saw a comment in here. No, no, I've lost it again. Uh, yeah. So I'm sorry. I've been struggling through this live stream. 
I think I need to go and have a nap or another coffee or something. But I am going to call it and say that is enough of me just rambling about silly things for today. I'm sure you've all had enough of it. Um, <laughs> so it's time to go and get yourself some lunch if you're in my time zone or <laughs> whatever other meal might be appropriate for the time of day where you are. And thank you very much for coming along. I will try to be a bit more organized for next Sunday and oh next Sunday I will have the new smart light switch PCBs they are currently in transit they're with DHL and they are on their way to me so by the time I stream next Sunday I should have assembled the updated version of the RGB smart light switches and I'll be able to show the result of that and I'm excited about that so that should be really cool Alrighty. Thanks for coming along. Have a fantastic weekend, what's left of it. And uh, I will see you all next week. See ya.